See, the weather doesn't stop some people anyway. We are, uh, we're hardy people here in Rochester, aren't we? I'm Bill Sowers. I'm president of the Greece Historical Society. I want to welcome everybody. I know we've got some new people here, but we have these presentations generally once a month from uh, September on through into May. Tonight, uh, we have a special program. The program is sponsored by the New York Council for Humanities. And we have Sally Roach. I felt I couldn't really do a good introduction, so I invited Deborah Hughes from the Susan B. Anthony House to introduce our speaker. So, Deborah. Thank you very much, Bill. When I was a little girl in the 60s, I was misled by my three older sisters. They led me to believe that we were a part of a brand new movement called feminism, and that if we were brave and strong and had good voices, we could call ourselves radicals. Well, it was later in the 1980s when I was studying at Colgate Rochester Crozier Theological Seminary that I heard the first thing about women's liberation and theology, and I thought that was a new and a radical concept. Well, thank goodness we have in our presence the scholars who can tell us the truth, that the first women to call themselves by that label feminists were in the 18th and 19th century, and that they proudly also wore the label radicals. And most of the ideas that I was introduced to in seminary in the 80s as brand new ideas were ideas that actually had their beginning from the women in the 18th century. It is often that we lose the story along the way, and it takes wonderful scholars and historians like Dr. Sally Rush Wagner to bring us back to the truth. Sally, the executive director of the Matilda Joslin Gage Center in Fayetteville, New York, is a nationally known lecturer and a performance interpreter of women's rights history. She was one of the first women to receive a doctorate in the United States for work in women's studies from the University of California at Santa Cruz. Now, though there were radical feminists a hundred and some years before, they weren't allowed into halls of education, you know. And she was the founder of one of the country's first college women's studies programs at California State in Sacramento. Dr. Wagner has taught women's studies for 38 years and currently serves as adjunct faculty at the Honors Program at Syracuse University. She's a good friend of the Susan B. Anthony House, and we enjoy doing some truth-telling about Matilda Joslyn Gage and Susan B. Anthony across the way between the two locations. You have probably seen Sally, if you're a lover of history, as she was calling herself a talking head in the Ken Burns documentary, Not For Ourselves Alone the story of, Susan, of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, for which she wrote the accompanying faculty guide for PBS. 
She was also an historian in the PBS special, One Woman, One Vote, and is frequently interviewed on National Public Radio or the History Channel as an expert on things from the history. The theme of her work has been to recover and to tell the untold stories. Just as my sisters corrupted history a little bit, you know, often it's the real movers and shakers who get lost behind the people who get into the press. The characters like Susan B. Anthony, who would be the first to tell you that she never did her work alone. She did it with many others. But you might not know how significant in her life and her work was Matilda Jocelyn Gage and other characters. And tonight, we can see that they were even affected dramatically and profoundly by the women who were of the First Nations in our region and our country, as Sally shares with us their untold stories. We know that in history, often we remake the myths so that indeed even the families and especially the spouses and partners of some of the characters that we hold dear and almost worship wouldn't recognize them from the telling of the modern story. It is through the kinds of work like the Greece Historical Society that we attempt to uncover the truth and tell the stories about very real human lives in very significant historical contexts so that we might gain insight and understanding into our present circumstance. How wonderful it is that we in upstate New York have Dr. Wagner here among us and how marvelous that she's here on a beautiful Rochester evening, having brought a little Syracuse weather with her to share with us tonight. Sally, welcome. You know, I, I was uh, very moved by what you said, and thank you for the wonderful introduction. But as an historian, I was doubly moved because I thought, this really is an historic moment. This, you will be able to tell your grandchildren that you were present the very first time that the director of the Susan B. Anthony House introduced the director of the Matilda Jocelyn Gage home. <laughs> and I think um, Deborah and I had dinner together tonight and began to talk about and, and continued a conversation that we've begun about ways that we can, can tell the fullest story that we both know at both of the houses. And so I think it, I'm just, I'm very honored that you uh, introduced me and thank you for such a wonderful introduction. I was thinking about the term radical. I'll share a little anecdote with you. Matilda Jocelyn Gage's granddaughter, I remember when uh, she was, shall we say, a, a relatively conservative woman. And I was reading her something that I'd written about her grandmother in which I called her grandmother a radical. And she used to take a nap uh, underneath eye shades uh, while I would read to her in the afternoon. And I never knew if she was awake or asleep. So what I would try to do is to wait until I thought she was asleep and slip some of the more <laughs> you know, difficult to, uh, to stomach information about her grandmother in while, uh, while I thought she would probably take it in subliminally, but perhaps not, not totally. Well, I was sure she was asleep, and then out from under these eye shades, and I, I don't know if you know, you know, you put them over. Well, this was long eyelashes. One was blinking, you know, sort of this winking person. She was in her 90s and was under these winking eye shades, which was in itself a little bit disarming. And I said something about her, you know, her radical grandmother, and out from under the eye shades came. Why are you calling my grandmother radical? And I explained to her that in the 19th century, radical was a very honorable term. And it meant that you understood how the tree of oppression worked. The upas, is that the per correct pronunciation? Sometimes when you live in a world 100 years ago, you don't know how to pronounce the, the language. U-P-A-S, it's a tree that's poison. And their concept was, if you cut off the, the branches of the tree, you know, you make tiny reforms, for example, in slavery, the institution, what's going to happen? Every gardener can tell you. Tree's going to grow stronger, isn't it? 
What you have to do is to dig the tree of oppression out at its roots, hence the term radical. And when I finished explaining it, Matilda Jewell Gage looked out from under her eye shades and said, I wish you would tell that to all my Episcopalian friends. <laughs> so Episcopalian or not, you now know that when we speak of ourselves and our foremothers as radicals, we're doing it in the most honorable sense and that we are part of a wonderful long tradition. And now I want to take you to a moment in history in 1888 and you are in the company of every radical feminist of note, not just in the United States, but in the, in the world. It's the International Council of Women, the first time women have gathered internationally to talk about their rights, to talk about their condition. And they have pulled this event together in Washington, D.C., and Susan B. Anthony is there, and Matilda Jocelyn Gage is there, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton is there. And if you don't recognize all three of those names, and I'm sure you recognize two of them, they were considered at the time the triumvirate of the National Woman Suffrage Association, the three major figures. They're sitting in the audience and they're listening to a woman named Alice Fletcher, who is herself a radical feminist, She's also an ethnographer, an early anthropologist. And she begins her story telling, she begins her talk telling a story about being with a group of Native women, uh, Omaha women, in the, the uh, western states or the prairie states. And one of the women gives away a horse. And Alice Witcher said, you know, without even thinking, I said to her, aren't you going to ask your husband first? And she said, the merriment with which my statement was met. This woman starts laughing, this Native woman, and then she starts telling all her friends. And she said, suddenly I was the subject of everyone's merriment. I had forgotten for a moment that I was with Indian women. I had forgotten that I was not, and, and everyone in the audience, you all radical feminists understand perfectly. What she's talking about is that Native women have their own property. They have always, as far as any of you know, and Matilda Jocelyn Gage, the major historian in the, in the, the room, absolutely knows this, they have always had their property. This is at a time when the radical feminists are fighting the tradition, the Western Christian tradition of the two shall become one and the one is the man. So that when you marry, it's not just that you lose your name, you lose your what? You lose your identity. You don't just lose your rights, you lose your identity. You cease to exist legally. The term is dead in the law. The two shall become one. Canon law becomes the foundation for common law. Matilda Jocelyn Gage explains in her book, Woman, Church, and State, in 1893. And she says, common law then defines women as non-existent. So how could you own your own property? Property can't own property. How could you have any rights to your children? Property can't own property, and children were considered property of the father. A husband, Matilda Jocelyn Gage wrote about, could will away an unborn child. One of the stories the women talked about was, it was actually Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote up this story, or it was written in uh, one of the feminist newspapers in Nebraska when Stanton was visiting there. A husband had TB, or consumption as it was called then, and he was dying. He was from Germany. His wife was pregnant. I'm using language that's 21st century language. You know, we would not have talked about pregnancy in, uh, in the 19th century, but I'll make it easier for us to understand. So she's pregnant, and 
he is dying. She's nursing him through his final hours, his final days. And he says, I, I need to talk to an attorney. I need to make my will. So she gets one. And she, of course, leaves when they're doing that because it would have been inappropriate for a woman to have been in the room while this work was being done. Shortly after he wrote his will, he passed on. And then she gave birth to the child. Now, you can imagine what that child meant to that mother. It was the reminder, the last thing she had connecting her to this man that she had so loved. A few months passed, and one day the attorney appeared at the door with a strange man. She didn't recognize him, and she invited them in and asked what they wanted, and the attorney said, we've come for the child. And the mother said, what are you talking about? Well, in your husband's will, he gave the child to his father in Germany. Father has come now to get the child. And that child was taken from its mother's arms and sent to Germany with the child's grandfather. And the mother had absolutely no legal recourse. She had no right to her child. And why? Because she was property. And property has no right to property. Now, you're beginning to get the, the idea here, and this all may be news to you. If it's, if it's old hat, it's, it's nothing new. But if this is a new way of understanding to you, you're beginning to see how far down the, the food chain the vote is, huh? I mean, first of all, you have to have a legal identity. Ultimately, you have some self-control and some self-governance. Now, here's the kicker. You live in the United States of America, which is what kind of a government? It's a republic, and what's it based on? It's not based on the divine right of kings. It's based on and democracy. What are we getting at there? What gives it its right to exist? The people. It's based on the consent of the governed, right? And how is consent given? Through the vote. So Matilda Jocelyn Gage questioned, if this is a republic based on the consent of the governed, do women have the right to vote? How would you answer that? Follow the logic here. The logic is they do. Absolute, right? Anybody disagree with that? If it's a republic based on the consent of the governed, then it logically follows women have the right to vote. So you see the contradiction that the government was caught up in. The women had logic on their side. But anti-suffrage had something stronger than that. Hmm? What? Power. power, yeah. And the authority of power. And if the tradition that you come from says that women, because of the sin of Eve, shall be subordinate to men, and they shall then be under the authority of their husbands. And there's no statute of limitations on Genesis, I'm afraid. So when does this end? It doesn't. The two shall become one, and the one is the man, because the wife must be on, under the authority of the husband. You get the power democracy that says women absolutely have the right to vote. On the other hand, you have a tradition that says what? You work for the right to vote, you're going to wish you were someplace other than this because, or maybe you're going to wish that you were in Rochester on a night like this, because you're going to be in a very, very, very hot place. You'll be dreaming of this night in Rochester. Because what you are going up against is the will of God. Hmm? 
Is this getting a little squeamish? I'm speaking through Matilda Jocelyn Gage's voice here. This is her analysis of what's going on in the 1890s, okay? So, you're a heathen, you're a heretic, you're a, all of those words. If you want the right to vote, you wonder why it took 72 years? You know, I'm a little worried about going up against God. I don't know about you, but you know, if that's who you've got to get through to get the vote, that's a little daunting, huh? That's what the women were up against. Now think about this for a minute. You want, and, and the right to vote comes really maybe layers after, you want the right to be free from being beaten by an angry husband. Who has the authority to do that? As long as he does it with nothing larger than his thumb, the rule of thumb of law. And as long, the Supreme Court in South Carolina said, as long as he does not inflict permanent damage. A woman beaten savagely by her husband is beginning to recover and the Supreme Court says he has not broken any law because we think she'll recover and if we interfere we will be upsetting and stick with me on this language we will be upsetting the domestic tranquility of the home. No humor intended in this. What does the domestic tranquility of the home rest on? The absolute power and authority of the father. And if you upset that, you're upsetting something very, very powerful. So if you say, I want to be free of violence, well, I'm sorry, but your husband needs to enforce his authority on you because if you die in a state of disobedience to him you are going to go to hell and whose fault will it be? Follow the logic here. Whose fault will it be? It will not be your fault. It will be his fault because you are to be under the authority of him and he must enforce that authority in any way, if he loves you. If he wants you to share eternity in heaven with him, he will ensure that by ensuring that you obey him. Welcome to the 19th century. Want to go back? Sometimes I wonder if somebody's going to be standing up here in the 23rd century and describing the 21st century and saying, want to go back? And the audience is going to go, women made three-fourths of the wages men made. They were, you know, a third of them were beaten by their husbands. It was, you know, a third of the women were raped. I mean, it's, you know, no, I'm not going back. But come back with me to the 19th century and let's look at it some more. This is what these women were up against. I want to be warm on a night like this. Oh, you are all going to hell. I can't believe it. Am I the only woman in this room who will see eternity in heaven? Because I am wearing a skirt as the Bible dictates. When women started wearing trousers, Reverend Sutherland Sunderland, Reverend Sunderland in the Plymouth Congregational Church, Syracuse, New York, September 1852. Deuteronomy, woman shall not take unto herself that which pertaineth to man. And Susan B. Anthony and Lucy Stone and those bloomer wearing women at the recent convention in Syracuse will not see heaven. Now, would you be wearing the bloomers if that's what you were facing? I, mean, I think it's important that we put ourselves into that position as much as we can. So once we achieve something, Elizabeth Cady Stanton said, everybody wonders what all the fuss was about. <laughs> 
what's all the fuss about? Remember in the 1970s when Phyllis Shafley told us that if we got the ERA, we'd have to share bathrooms? Well, we share bathrooms now, but we don't have equal rights under the law in the United States of America. We got the horse before the cart or the cart before the horse. If you wanted to have your own property, if you wanted to sue or be sued, First woman to practice be before the Supreme Court, you know who that was? The woman who ran for president in 1884. First woman to carry on a presidential campaign. Belva Lockwood, you know about her because of this area, right? Victoria Woodhull declared her candidacy in 72, but she spent it in jail under the Comstock Acts for exposing that the most famous minister in America who was preaching on Sunday morning against free love was practicing it on Saturday night with his parishioners. <laughs> Can you imagine that? That's what those people did in those old days, unlike today. <laughs> Belva Lockwood, first woman to practice before the Supreme Court. She was not allowed initially to practice, and you know why? To protect her husband. I know that you're in, really being pushed here in terms of logic, but we're doing patriarchal logic here, okay? Doesn't always follow a path that we can easily trace, but follow me with this protect her husband. Why? Because as a married woman, she could not sue or be sued. As a lawyer, if she misrepresents a client or a client is dissatisfied and wants to sue her, he can't. He, and I'm using the not generic here, he has to sue her husband. She doesn't exist under the law. The two shall become one, and the one is the man. I want to give you a flavor for what it was like for women at that time. Are you starting to feel like, I can't breathe? And that's because you're encased in what? Corset. And you've been corseting since you were about 10, maybe 12. And by the time you're in your 70s, you can't stand up without the corset because your body has become so dependent on it. But what you really want is to have a waist so small that your husband can put his arms around it, or your boyfriend, your sweetie, can put his arms around, his fingers around your waist. Like Nobody's waist is that small past childhood. But that was the goal, unlike today, when fashion gives us a model that any of us can make, right? <laughs> yeah, if we want to starve ourselves and, and live on a diet that actually is literally a starvation diet. Same thing going on in the 19th century. You are corseted to within an inch of your life, and you often die in childbirth. All your vital organs distended. But it's natural to have a prolapsed uterus. I'm not even sure in mixed company in the 21st century that I want to explain to you what that is. If you want to know, see me later and I'll explain it to you in private, but it's not a pretty picture, trust me. And it was considered normal. Normal to die in childbirth, normal to not be able to breathe. And one of the feminist papers prints an article and says, you know what? Somebody did a study, an interesting study, looking at Indian women and white women to see if they had differences in breathing patterns. And you know what they discovered? That white women breathe shallowly and from the chest, and Indian women breathe full and from the diaphragm interesting piece of information. Like the women who laugh when you suggest 
that you need to check with your husband before you give away a horse. Or like the stories that you know from the time of white settlement in this country about how Indian women give birth easily. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton says, isn't it strange that only Christian women should suffer in childbirth? And you know what she's referring to, Genesis. Because of the sin of Eve, in pain and sorrow you shall bring forth children and be under the authority of your husband. Isn't it strange that only Christian women should suffer in childbirth? So Elizabeth K. Stanton says, I was called a savage when I went out and about right after the birth of my child. And then she says, you know what? I want to look at why it is that we suffer in childbirth. It's not because of any religious teaching. It is because we don't do exercise and we corset ourselves and we don't eat healthy food. Matilda Jocelyn Gage lived 20 miles from the Onondaga Nation, the center of the Iroquois Confederacy the center of the Haudenosaunee. And are you comfortable if I make the switch to the correct language at this point? You know, Iroquois is an imposed term. The self term is Haudenosaunee, the people of the Longhouse. So you'll follow me if we start using the right language, okay. Center of the Haudenosaunee Longhouse, Onondaga. She lives that close. She visits at Onondaga. Lucretia Mott, right before she came to Seneca Falls to actually Waterloo, and they planned that first women's rights convention, you know where she was? Cataraugus, hanging out with Seneca women. She watched the women plan one of the ceremonies, the strawberry ceremony. She saw the women be totally involved in an equal way with a decision about the political future of the Seneca. Now think with me about what that would mean. You live in a world where you don't have any authority at all in terms of the governance of your life. You don't in the home. You're under the authority of your husband. In childhood, you're under the authority of your father, and that's transferred in what Matilda Jocelyn Gage refers to as a barbaric ceremony, where the property transference of the white encased virgin, the white indicating that she's undamaged goods, is transferred from the husband, or from the father to the husband. What does that marriage ceremony mean? It means, Elizabeth Cady Stanton said, that you should really read the fine print and that what women really need is a quit claim deed to their own bodies. Because starting from the governance of your own body, making choices about your own body, you have no say all the way up to the federal government, every single level of decision. You have no say in your life. You don't see women preaching from the pulpit. Well, if you lived in this area, maybe you did in Henrietta, huh? Antoinette Brown, first woman ordained in the country. Well, guess what, folks? She was ordained in the same way that the first woman Catholic priest was ordained in Rochester in 2001. And how is that? Out of the church, not recognized, huh? The first woman regularly ordained, as we call it, recognized by the church of any denomination in this country, you know when it was? And who it was? It wasn't until the 1870s. It was Antoinette Brown. I'm, I'm sorry, Olympia Brown, Unitarian. 
The Unitarians are always out there in the front, aren't they? The Universalists. <laughs> so I, you're a Unitarian. Ah, uh, yeah, I could spot you. <laughs> she did the yes. <laughs> so Lucretia Mott sees women with a spiritual voice. She sees them with a political voice. And when they're sitting in that audience in 1888 at the International Council of Women, these women have a long history of knowing about the Haudenosaunee and knowing the Haudenosaunee. Starting from that moment when Lucretia Mott comes back to her Quaker friends and they talk about their lives, and we know it was a personal discussion, because it, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton says, I poured out all the discontent in my heart. And she named that as the origins of the women's rights movement, the discontent. But let me propose to you that there may have been a counter to that discontent. Discontent without the possibility of change creates depression. Ain't it awful? But there's nothing we can do about it. This is God's will and biological necessity. That's what the world was telling these women. But Lucretia Mott saw in practice that it could be different. She saw empowered women. Now imagine that you live in a world where we just accept that rape of women is just a given. What's going to happen to you if you go to a world where rape just doesn't exist? And if it does, it is dealt with so harshly that the punishment is, is worse than death. It's exclusion from the human community. It's a living death. What's going to happen to you if you visit that world? You're not going to know how to live in it. Or you're going to go, and you may be like the caged bird. Who You open the cage, and the bird's been in the cage so long it doesn't even know how to fly. But you may be like the school teachers that Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Matilda Jocelyn Gage read about in the front page of the New York Tribune or the New York Herald or one of the New York papers when the school teachers are interviewed when a whole feature story is done, a series about the Haudenosaunee. And one after another, these school teachers say, you know what? I am freer in Indian country than I have ever been in my own town. And, you know, the, the, the teacher at Onondaga Nation who says that she can go anywhere she wants, any time of the day or night, in absolute safety. And the teacher who teaches in a Seneca nation who says, you know what, I have never been insulted. And that's 19th century buzzword, insulted. I have never been sexually harassed or abused. She says, any time I have been teaching on an Indian nation. And I have always been when I teach in a white town. you get a vision that it's possible to change the world, right? If you know one group of men, and if you read Elias Johnson's The Tuscarora's History, which was very popular in 1881, you will learn that among Native men, violating women is just unknown. And he says, not even tongue in cheek, this was also the case among the Germans until they became civilized. During the Sullivan-Clinton campaign, the scorched earth policy of General Washington who said, 
you will kill every single living thing that you find. And some of the soldiers protested saying, you know, we didn't enlist to kill vegetables when they're forced to cut down all of the fruit trees and destroy all of the crops and create the conditions of starvation for the Haudenosaunee, there was not enough money to pay the Revolutionary War soldiers. They mapped out this land before the war was over. And that land was given in payment to the Revolutionary War soldiers. The first incursion was against the Onondaga, who were neutral. And the men, according to oral tradition and written sources alike, the soldiers raped a whole, they found a group of women and children in a field. And they did what Western war has always done. They used rape as a form of warfare. And Clinton wrote to the commander and said, one thing about these Indian men is that they don't rape women, even ones they've taken captive. And then the telling line, perhaps our soldiers could learn something from these savages. The 19th century literature that I read is full of this back and forth about who is civilized and who is savage and what does civilization mean for women. And Matilda Jocelyn Gage just very frankly and boldly says, you know, you want to know the real savages? They're the civilized ones. Never was justice more perfect. Never was civilization higher, is the way she describes the Haudenosaunee. Clothing. Clothing. Maybe you're Elizabeth Smith Miller, the cousin of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the first woman that we have in our history books to wear the bloomer costume, a form of it. What we know from Henry B. Stanton, Elizabeth's husband, is that whenever they went to visit Cousin Garrett, who was Elizabeth Smith Miller's father, any time they went to visit Cousin Garrett Smith, they're always, Henry says, abolitionists, women's rights, fugitive slaves, Indians, and re radical reformers of every ilk. So let's say you're a white woman and you're sitting there with your corseted body, you can't breathe and you can't even take a bite of something and you have heels on that are throwing off your balance, your center of balance, and you look across the table and there's a woman who is comfortable. She's not corseted, she's wearing a long, to her knees dress and trousers underneath as far as you can tell. They're actually only leggings and they're fastened, tied, but they look like trousers under and you go, whoa, that's a pretty comfortable outfit. And maybe you start wearing something like that. Well, you know what? That could have happened, but Elizabeth Smith Miller wasn't the first woman to wear that costume. You know who it was? The Oneida women in the Oneida utopian community, which was built on Oneida nation land when the Oneida were sent to Wisconsin under the Trail of Tears time of Jacksonian democracy, our history books call it. Democracy for whom? All Indians need to be sent west of the Mississippi. That was the vision. And the white people took the land, and the Oneida community took that land. In an Indian cabin, and I found the cabin, in an Indian cabin, it had been Oneida Nation, Oneida Indian property. 
in this cabin, one of the women from the Oneida community writes in their newspaper in 1848, in this cabin, we stayed up all night and sewed the reform dress which they wore in the United Community for a long time. And guess what that reform costume was? You can find it at the Syracuse University Special Collections, Oneida Collection. You can see it at the Oneida Community. They have original 1848 costumes. And guess what, folks? It's a kind of a loose-fitting tunic dressed on to the knees. And you know what's underneath it? That wonderful white woman invention, leggings. Leggings. Where are white women going to get the idea of leggings? They actually didn't tie them. They buttoned them onto the dress. But they are definitely native leggings. Now maybe I'm pushing it to think that there might be a little bit of connection here. I'll leave it to you to decide. I started with the question, how did Matilda Jocelyn Gage get a vision of transforming the world that went right from the kind of oppression that we've been talking about through equality straight to a world in balance and harmony? How did she see from A to C? She's got to have seen something that led her to believe it was possible. That was my research question. I got a National Endowment for the Humanity Fellowship to spend nine months studying that pregnant question. And you know what I gave birth to? It was something that I should have seen years before. And if I hadn't been so clouded by my own stereotype assumptions, and I'll be honest with you, my own racism, I would have seen it the minute I picked up Matilda Jocelyn Gage's book, Woman, Church, and State, and read in the first seven pages about the Haudenosaunee, where she says, never was justice more perfect, never was civilization higher. Now, any of you good scholars would have seen that and said, that's the place to look. Look, look, look. There, there, there. But you know what I knew? I knew better than that. I knew that Indian women were beasts of birth. And I knew without even knowing it that they had nothing to teach white women. I say that to you with absolutely no pride. I say that to you with the deepest humility. Because what that's done, that realization that my racism stood in the way of my scholarship, for years and years is to know, well, you know, I'm not suddenly transformed into somebody different. That still is clearing everything that I see through that filter. And I have to be always constantly aware of that and concerned and watchful. And I don't think probably that I'm too atypical in that. I wish I was. I wish I didn't think that was true of most scholarship. But what astounds me is why have no scholars made this connection to this point? It's clear, you know, as the nose on my face to me now. And I'll, I, you know, you shouldn't accept any of this on faith. I've given you some of the information, and there's more of it in this book. How did people miss the fact that Elizabeth Cady Stanton's closest neighbor in Seneca Falls was a man who had, before he moved to Seneca Falls, a trading post at Onondaga. He spoke the language fluently. He had been adopted into one of the clans. His Onondaga relatives came to visit him regularly. How did we miss that Elizabeth Cady Stanton's cousin, Peter Skenendor Smith, was named for a close family friend, the Oneida chief, Skenendor, or Skenendoa. How did we miss that Lucretia Mott came from 
Cattaraugus, Seneca Nation, to Waterloo and brought that vision that faced the discontent of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and said, you know what? I just was somewhere where women live in a way that is unbelievable. It can happen. It can happen. You read in the newspaper that there are women who live without fear of rape and you know it's got nothing to do with male genes. It's got nothing to do with hormones. It has to do with the way that we create our society. And we can create different human beings. You know that because you've seen it. I think that it was simply knowing their neighbors knowing the world that, ironically, we were trying to destroy at the very moment. You know, the same Quakers that were having the mission at Cattaraugus, or they didn't call it a mission, but 1845, and this was in the newspapers in 1845, you would have picked up the paper in Rochester and read this story, they held a council with the Seneca and they said, you know what, we've done everything we can to help you protect your land, the, um, you know, the Buffalo Creek Treaty and the taking of the land, that illegal taking of the land. We've, we've done everything we can to help you in that respect. And we've educated your children, but now there's nothing more we can do with you or for you until your women go into the home as they should be and the men come into the field and till the soil as God has meant them to do. That turned the culture upside down. The women were the agriculturalists. They raised corn beans and squash. You know this, the three sisters. Ecologically and nutritionally perfect food. The, what is it, the beans set the nitrates in the soil for the corn? Or does it go the other way around? It's ecologically friendly, and there are few groups of food that are perfect food. You can live indefinitely on just those foods. In combination, the three sisters are a perfect food. In combination. The women were such incredible agriculturalists that they had two to three years supply of food in underground caches at all times. So let's say that the the Mohawks had a bad year, they would just ask the Omaha or the Oneida or the, the Onondaga to help them out. They'd give them food for a year, nobody would ever go hungry. Agriculture today is so far in progress of that. Huh? I think it was not just the women's rights movement. I think, and my hunch is, and I'm writing a, a, another book now that carries this further, I think that the reality that we know as historians that every radical reform movement sprang up right here in this soil may have to do with white people playing Indian. If you live in Onondaga and you know that there's a woman there named Aunt Dinah who may have lived to be over 110, you live in the city of Syracuse and you read the paper and Aunt Dinah is welcome in every single home in Syracuse and she walks in every day past her 100th year and sells her baskets. Maybe you think, you know, and maybe you don't know that the actuarial figures are that you're probably going to live to be 50 if you're lucky. And here's Aunt Dinah twice that age. What's the difference? What are you eating? Well, in Syracuse, we eat what? Salt pork. We wash it down with whiskey or 
and we sure as heck are not going to touch fresh vegetables. We have to boil the bee Jesus out of them because we know that raw vegetables are going to kill us. And then we look at our neighbors who are eating corn, beans, and squash. They don't touch salt. They don't eat sugar. They, um, how do they sweeten their food? Maple syrup. Maple syrup. And they're living to be twice as long as we are. And guess what, folks? We start a food reform movement. And you know what we eat? We throw away the salt pork. We start eating fresh fruits and vegetables. We start eating corn, beans, and squash. And we live to be longer. And historians come along 100 years later and say, this was the food reform movement. Medicine, how do we treat ourselves when we're sick? We call in the doctor, of course. And what does the doctor do for us? Huh? Well, I'll give you an example. And this is from my new book that, that I'm working on now. The, this was the, um, the president of the New York Medical Association describes his treatment of a patient. He's a young, robust man. He comes to him, he's very sick. He's got a fever. So what's the first thing you do? You take a pint of blood out of him. You bleed him to get rid of the evil that's invading his body. And then he poured cold water over him to bring down the fever. And then he gave him mercury because every doctor has mercury in his bag and that's the major, that's the aspirin of the 19th century. Now maybe he gets mercury poisoning and dies but that's not the mercury poisoning because we don't know that mercury is poisonous. We figure it's the fever got him. There's a doctor, actually he's not a doctor. He's a minister that writes to a friend of his and he says, one of my men in Canada, they're among the Mohawk, got sick and this is how the Mohawks treated him and he got well. And he describes the process of the herbs that were given and he says, I send this for the benefit of mankind. I send this for the benefit of mankind. Now what happens when white people stop bleeding, stop poisoning themselves with mercury, stop, you know, who was it? The Chief Justice who said, uh, if all the medicine that's prescribed was thrown into the ocean, it would be so much better for the people and so much worse for the fishes. Been provided with everything needed to make us well. Called them homeopaths, alternative medicine, yep. Naturopaths, hydropathy. But what they were doing was doing what native people were doing to heal themselves. And my hunch is that's probably true of all the radical reform movements that sprang up in this area. I am convinced that that was the vision that spoke to the women who started the women's rights movement. It said to them, it is neither God ordained nor determined by biology that you must be submissive to men. Matilda Jocelyn Gage in 1893 was arrested. You know what her crime was? She voted. Just like Susan B. Anthony was arrested in 1871, she was arrested for voting in a school board election. That year, 1893, Matilda Jocelyn Gage was adopted into the Wolf Clan of the Mohawk Nation. She was given a name that is a name that's still used at Akwesasne today. And she writes to her daughter and says, my Mohawk sisters are considering a possibility of my becoming a part of the Council of Matrons, which would give me a say in the choosing of the chief. 
She wrote about, as did Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the Klan mothers, nominating the chiefs, holding them in position, removing them, having that responsibility if they don't meet the needs of the people. Arrested for voting in her own nation, this woman who spent her entire life working to get women a voice in every aspect of their lives, including political, is adopted into a nation. She describes it as a sovereign nation. She says, these nations among us are absolute sovereign every bit as much as Canada and Mexico. And at a point when the United States, or the New York state government, was considering a bill which would give citizenship to Indian men, and the chiefs and council at Onondaga said absolutely no, you know, we're citizens of our own nations. Matilda Jocelyn Gage, a radical feminist, writes an editorial in her newspaper in support of the decision of the chiefs. And she says, isn't it the greatest hypocrisy that this country is trying to force citizenship on Indian men the better to steal their lands while denying it to its women citizens? Justice to the Indians requires living up to the treaties we have with them. This woman who supported native rights and sovereignty, this woman has written from 1875 when she was president of the National Woman Suffrage Association, wrote a series of front page articles in the New York Herald about the superior position of Haudenosaunee women. This woman is adopted into a nation in 1893 and has the possibility of a political voice in that nation the same year she's arrested for voting in her own nation. Now maybe it's pure speculation that this might have influenced her. Maybe it's pure speculation that white people living among native people and seeing a world that they can barely dream about, seeing it in practice, in action, gives them the knowledge that it's possible and the courage to fight for it. I leave it to you to decide. Thank you. Anybody have any uh, questions or comments? I'd like to bring the mic to you. Could you just give a bio of the woman, how many children she had, and just who she was, really? Because I think a lot of people don't really know just the dynamic who she was. Oh, is that all right if I, if I answer that quickly? Matilda Jocelyn Gage, born in 1826 in Cicero, died in 1898 in the home of her son in law and her daughter. Her son-in-law was a ne'er-do-well who she opposed the marriage initially. She said, you know, he's never going to be able to support you, this itinerant actor. He's a great visionary. But Maud, do not drop out of college in your second year and marry a guy who's never going to be able to support the family. And she was right. Went bankrupt time after time until finally her son-in-law, and this is the moral of the story, so I'll give it to you first, listen to your mother-in-law. She said to him, Frank, the stories that you tell your boys are absolutely wonderful. Write them down. Two years after her death, her son-in-law, L. Frank Baum, published The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. She gave the vision for the 14 Oz books, which if you haven't read them and you think in terms of Judy Garland, forget it. Oz is a matriarchy. Everybody gets what they need, they get what they, they give what they can and they get what they need. Ozma, actually the second book in the Oz series, we're introduced to this boy who's a boy, 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 a boy's boy. At the end of the book he realizes he's a female trapped in a male body, book written in 1904, and if he is to be his true authentic self, he has to undergo a sex change. 
he responds as any 10 year old boy would be would do and he says oh yuck I don't want to be a girl but the tin woodman the cowardly lion and the scarecrow say girls are every bit as good as boys maybe even better will love you just the same and at the end of the book he goes through the transformation and emerges his true self Ozma he's been bewitched by an evil witch Mombi Nothing like writing on the cutting edge of gender politics, huh? In 1904, what are the chances this guy without a mother-in-law who's living with them six months of the year and guiding that vision? That's one of the stories. Another story is that when she was six months pregnant, she was pregnant. I don't know how, I can't tell you how many months she was pregnant. She was pregnant. She had two children. The head of the Underground Railroad in Syracuse comes to the house and says, will you offer your home as a station? She not only says, I will. She faced six months in prison and a $1,000 fine, $23,000 in today's money. She not only said she would do it, she publicly signed a petition saying, basically, come and get me. She was equal in positions of leadership in the National Women's Suffrage Association with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. She was a theoretician, a writer. She and Anthony actually organized and did the work of the organization, and she and Stanton wrote the documents. So she was really both uh, a writer, theoretician, activist. She and Anthony, and this is part of this wonderful history that Deborah and I and, and our organizations are creating right now, is finding how do we tell the true story of the dispute that these two women had toward the end? And I'm going to try it. And then if you would help me with it, this would be wonderful. We'll give you, we'll give you a moment in history. The way I understand it, and that we tell the story at the Gage Home, is that this was not a monolithic movement. You know, It wasn't everybody agreeing. We don't need to think of women as being you know, in, in any way different than men politically. They had different visions and different goals. Anthony's thought was, we get the vote first. Once we get the vote, it'll be the tool that we need to change the condition of women. Now, that's a perfectly respectable idea, isn't it? Now, what's the goal? What's, what's the process you use to get there? Well, here's a woman who leads a movement of 250,000 women. There are at most 25,000, a tenth of that, in the women's rights movement. This woman wants to get women the right to vote. Are you going to go after her and make a coalition with her and go, yes, let's work together? Be perfectly respectable and sensible, wouldn't it? Well, this woman was Frances Willard, who was the president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, an organized army of love, mother love for God, home, and country. She had received a visit from God, she said, in 1876, in which she was instructed to get women the right to vote in order to put God in the Constitution and prayer in the public schools, destroying the wall of separation between church and state, which Jefferson and the Founding Fathers said was absolutely essential to liberty. Gage said it's the greatest danger of the hour if we lose religious freedom in this country, it's not going to matter who votes. Anthony said, let's get the vote first and we'll work out the differences later. Anthony's perspective and her direction won. You come up, differences in a movement, what happens to the loser? They're very often lost to history, huh? And that's basically why we don't know about Matilda Jocelyn Gage. But isn't that a richer story of what went on in the movement? Would you share your thoughts about that, Deborah? I'm sorry, we will get to your questions, but this is just, this is just such a rare historic moment. This one's, this one's what I want. OK, this is my question. Uh, the, um, we were talking earlier at dinner. One of the interesting contrasts was Susan B. Anthony was faced with a similar decision earlier on, at the time of the 14th and the 15th Amendment, when the issue was, would emancipated black men get the right to vote? Up until that time, the abolitionists often were a good force, 
with the suffrage movement, and it brought white men into the movement who were passionate about abolition and supported also the women's rights movement. And Susan B. Anthony could see that they were going to lose those men, and of course there weren't going to be any women voting for suffrage if black men got the right to vote, and then of course also had the perception of did we think that women, black women were not enslaved as well. And so she had seen at one point the loss of a major coalition and how much that set back the movement toward suffrage. So she did a compromise. She was much more able to build coalitions, but to gauge, yes, this was terrifying. I mean, these religious people were scary. And the other interesting piece was while it brought 10 times as many people into the movement, it also brought the liquor lobby in opposition to the movement. Because if these temperance women got the right to vote, one of the very first things they intended to do was prohibition. And, you know, we got prohibition before we got women the right to vote. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This, both of those are really important points. This is exciting, isn't it? I, when I teach my classes at Syracuse University, the first class, which will be tomorrow night, I say to them, we are going to history. History needs to be a verb, not a noun. It's a process. And what we just did was history. Not as a noun. We historied. <laughs> um, anyway, you know what? We have some brochures about the, from the Matilda Jocelyn Gage Foundation. Would you mind? And, and I know you're not a dupe for us. You, you didn't really set me up with that question. But it really is important to know about her. And thank you for asking that. And thank you so much, Deborah, for sharing that. But this will tell you a little bit more about Gage. And you have a question. You've been so patient. Thank you. You, uh, uh, you connected uh, several reform movements to the influence of the voting of Tony. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't say anything about the, um, the sort of uh, burnt over district from a spiritual perspective. Mm -hmm. um, do you see a connection there? Well, I know Whitney Cross's work is it's like axiomatic now. You know, the burned over district is part of the jargon that we use. And the idea is that, that these reform movements sprang up because there was wave after wave of religious evangelism that, that spread through the area. And that that really caused the idea of perfection. You know, we can create a different world. And I think maybe in some general way that was, there's always, of course, a variety of influences. But let me tell you the skepticism that I have about that. And it happens when you look at the particulars. I could not probably give you the language with which Frederick Douglass, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Matilda Jocelyn Gage spoke about organized religion in the 19th century without clearing this hall. You would be so outraged. When I did a Gage or a Stanton performance at the, um, the anniversary, the 100th anniversary of the Woman's Bible in Seneca Falls, and I used the language of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and a woman stood up in the eyes, it was in the church where, you know, the Episcopal church where Elizabeth Cady Stanton attended, not the building, but the, the denomination. She said she went there because it was, they had the best music in town and she could be away from her seven kids for an hour and put her feet up and, you know. Anyway, um, but in that denomination, and with the minister's not only permission, but recommendation that I speak the truth of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, a woman stood up in the audience and with trembling voice said, I have to say this, and it was so painful and hard for her to say it. She said, I have to witness what I heard here tonight was heresy. It was heresy. It was the exact words of Elizabeth Cady Stanton in 1895. And a hundred years later, a woman in that Denominate in that church building said, this is heresy. Now, burned over district, how are these people influenced? Finney, right? Finney is the great name that we know. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, in her autobiography, 80 Years and More, talks about a psychological breakdown that she had as a result of Finney's description of hell. She said it was so real, he pointed his finger and I leapt to my feet expecting to see it. She would at night kneel at her father's bed and say, 
he would wake up and there she was saying, Father, pray for me for I may die before I wake. You know, before morning I may die before morning. She lived in absolute terror. Her father took her out of school. They traveled to, you know, I think to Niagara Falls. And for six weeks there was no talk of religion that was allowed. And she says her, it was her brother-in-law who brought the light of scientific truth to her and she finally was able to be a joyous child again. She talks about that sort of religious fundamentalism that she experienced as a form of child abuse. Now that sort of, now wait a minute, Finney is the one who burned over this district and was supposed to have created all these radical reform movements. Well, he sure as heck created a radical reformer out of Elizabeth K. Stanton, but it wasn't the way Whitney Cross describes it. So yes, I think that sense of perfection and perfectibility, that vision, and I think there's other people to look at. Alexander Campbell, maybe even more instrumental, at least in my neck of the woods, uh, he came through here and turned all the Baptists into Campbellites. Uh, and, and it was a back to the gospel, it was back, you know, away from dogma and back to the, the authentic gospel. So I think absolutely, and I'm glad you made that point, I, I was doing too simplistic an analysis. There are a lot of different influences, but that's my mm, cautionary note about uh, you know, the burned over district idea. Because if you scratch every single one of these radical reformers, you find a critic of the church in such strong language that we're not even able to hear that today. And that, I include Frederick Douglass in that, his introduction to, I think it's the first publishing of his narrative, the introduction he wrote. Whew. Would you care to comment on the difference between Eastern Indians and, say, the Western tribes? Uh... I, you know, that's a that's a good question. Um, I, you know, and I, um, let me circle that a little bit. Can I? I have a sense that much of what we know as truth, anthropological truth may not stand the test of time. There are a whole world of native scholars now that are giving voice to the native experience. And much of the truth that we have assumed is beginning to be questioned as a result of their voices, which have always been there, now being you know, part of the, the sort of Western academic uh, conversation. Lakota friends talk about how the introduction of the horse unbalanced the, the balance between men and women in Lakota, Nakota, Dakota culture. Sioux, you know, the poison adder word, you know, all these nasty names we gave people when we came here and said, you're this, you're this, you're this. What's the, the Native American sticker that, that uh, you know, about Indians? Boy, we're sure glad Columbus didn't think he was in Turkey. Um, anyway, the Lakota friends, uh, here's a quick anecdote. I'm driving through Pine Ridge with a friend of mine, Karen Artichoker, and she says, oh yeah, that's that guy that the aunties just named the, or, or you know, acknowledged, recognized as the head of the Tayoshpe. I says, Karen, what are you talking about? That can't be happening. You know, so what do you mean? Anthropologists say that the Sioux never were, you know, teasing her about it. She's, and it's just sort of a, a convert, you know, just a dropping it in conversation. And I said, do you realize that that turns the anthropological knowledge of the Lakota on its head if that's still going on? And she said, yeah. Um, I'll tell you one other story. Virginia Driving Hawk Sneevy, a friend of mine, from Rosebud Reservation, again, the Sioux, the mighty fighting, you know, patriarchal Sioux, 
she said that when she was a young woman, there were these anthropologists from Harvard or something, they were graduate students, and you know, they were kind of poking around with their pen and pencils and going around asking everybody all this stuff. Well, the kids decided, the teenagers decided to have some fun with them. So I don't know if you've ever experienced Lakota humor, but it is so deadpan. I mean, I've been you know, nailed by it so many times. You're all, oh, yeah, I got it. Um, so these teenagers take these anthropologists to the swimming hole. And they say, you know, the elders said we're not supposed to say anything about this, but there's an ancient mating ritual that we have in the summertime. And on the spot, they made up this ancient Lakota mating ritual that had never appeared in any anthropological text before. And these Harvard anthros were scribbling, scribbling, scribbling like crazy. And I imagine that somewhere, there's a dissertation that someone published, you know, on the great, you know, the great Lakota mating ritual. So much for anthropological knowledge. I mean, that one story, and, and you know, there's a lot of those stories circulating. I think until Native women sign in on this question, we are clueless about what it was for Western. Native women. That's that's the best I can give you. Okay, maybe you have time for one more. We we do have a time limit on the building before the maintenance staff gets overtime. So, uh, does anybody have any uh, any other comments, questions? Um, be sure okay. to uh, visit the Susan B. Anthony House if you haven't done so. And, uh, and if you're in the neighborhood on Sunday afternoon, uh, our organization owns a museum that's, that's right next door, and we're open on Sunday afternoons. I don't think... Um, and the Gage Foundation is oh. open <laughs> uh, if you call and would like a tour, especially once it gets warm. We're, we're doing rehabilitation tours. We're in the process of rehabilitating the home. So you can visit Susan, and you can visit Matilda, and in between you can visit Elizabeth in Cedric Falls. They're equidistant on the throughway. Great. This program uh, has been recorded by our local cable channel, uh, 1215 um, on Ridgeway Avenue. I imagine if you want a copy, you could contact them, and I'm sure for a small fee, they would make you a, a DVD. Okay, <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.